a warm welcome back to everyone who is in this room for our last session. And now it's my delight to introduce David Bell. David has recently started with Fast Ma uh, sorry, Mail Garden <laughs> South Melbourne. Bad session chair, I'll, I'll just get that. And he is the outgoing LCA 2016 conference director. So if you're in Geelong last year and enjoyed Geelong 2016, you have this man to thank. David's going to be speaking to us today about business continuity processes, disaster recovery planning and digital legacy. David will be taking questions at the end of the session. Uh, so if you do have questions, please keep them until the end of the session. Please give David a warm welcome. Thanks. Um, it's a bit of a dry topic, so I'm surprised how full the room is. So thanks, everyone, for coming along. Um, let's quickly go over who am I. Um, so I've recently joined uh, MailGuard as a system administrator and spam ninja. Um, prior to that, I've been there about three months, um, I spent three years working in the infrastructure team at an organisation called Treasury Corporation Victoria, um, which is where I was when I proposed the talk. I had the talk accepted and then the next day got a new job. Um, so relevance to present employee is slightly less. Um, I've been attending LCA since 2012. I wasn't at Canberra. I didn't get a Hawaiian shirt. This is my Hawaiian shirt. <laughs> um, and as Cathy mentioned, I was uh, LCA 2016 uh, conference director and have recently joined the council. Whoops again. Um, so before my talk, I just wanted to provide a little bit of background around Treasury Corporation of Victoria and why BCP and DRP are an important thing for them. Um, they're the central financing authority for the state of Victoria, which means that if a government department um, in Victoria wishes to spend some money and they need to borrow funds, they can't just go to a bank. They're not just like you or me and go get a mortgage. They have to come to us by legislation. Um, so we are the interface, well, I was the interface between the, the state authorities and the wholesale finance market. Um, they issue Australian government-backed bonds to international investors and domestic investors. If you have superannuation in Australia, I can almost guarantee you own some of these. Um, and they work very hard to maintain Victoria's AAA rating, um, which is obviously important as part of making sure you pay people on time, because you won't maintain it otherwise. Um, and they manage somewhere in the realm of 30 to $50 billion in state debt, um, and on any given any given business day might need to settle millions, tens of millions, possibly even billions of dollars um, with the sale of the port last year um, in trades on any given business day, and they must happen on time. So this is why business continuity is important um, and why we're in a position where we could evacuate at 2 p.m. and still be able to settle by 4 p.m. that day. Um, I also feel the need to present a little bit of a disclaimer. Um, I'm not here to wow you with any horror stories. Um, I can't share with you any tales of woe or heroism at running into a burning building and saving an AS400 um, <laughs> or performing CSI-style magic and recovering the data from a long-gone, bit-rotted backup DVD. Um, I'm here to talk to you about the exciting topics of process, testing, backups and documentation. Might have been slightly misleading, I'm sorry. Um, this advice is of a general nature. Your circumstances may differ. That's kind of interesting. Um, so I've already gone through those things. Um, I'll also go through a couple of definitions. Um, why you might need a BCP or DRP. Um, how to go about creating your BCP. Testing, 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 testing. Um, building a positive culture of business continuity in your organization how to break the glass, and some personal applications of this as well. So I'm going to quickly go through some definitions. Um, these aren't necessarily terms that we'll go into in depth today, um, but they'll help you with your own research, planning, and should probably form some of the language um, of your policies and procedures internally. So we'll start with BCP, Business Continuity Plan. Um, as you can see there, it's a process of creating physical um, systems and systems of process to prevent and recover from interruption events. Um, it should be a living document. I'd suggest putting it in your wiki somewhere, allowing people to contribute, um, making sure you have an offline copy because you might not have your wiki. Um, so regularly update it, make sure you keep the offline copy also updated and accessible. 
a business interruption event is anything that could interrupt the normal flow of your day-to-day -day operations. Um, so it might mean you can't get into the office or it might mean that your systems are offline. How do you continue? And of course, DRP, your disaster recovery plan. Um, how do you recover your production systems when they've all burst into flames or the cybers have attacked them and they're no longer owned by you? Um, I personally consider business continuity to be more sort of business process focused. So how do we continue to produce our widgets? How do we continue to report to our customers um, and provide support? I see DRP as good, more of an IT owned process where how do we get our, our systems back up and running to support the business in continuing? Um, RPO, which is a recovery point objective, it's a targeted point in time for recovery. So think close of business, previous day, it might be end of financial year if you haven't done your backups recently. It might be sometime last year if you really haven't done your backups recently. Or it might be five minutes ago if that system is super critical to you. Um, RTO recovery time objective. So when do you need that system back? Maybe you need that system back now. You need that system immediately because you have financial systems that you need to make settlements on. Or perhaps it might be your accounting system and you don't have to report your BAS for another month. Um, it's important to be aware of these and make sure that your business also knows what these are so that they have expectations and those expectations match what you're aiming to deliver. And of course, digital legacy, which is your personal digital artifacts and accounts. Um, and how you should consider what happens to those when you no longer need them because you're no longer here. So, why BCP? Because things will go wrong. You will lose physical or virtual access to your office, to your systems. You might even lose your systems entirely. You may lose people. Because things shouldn't have to get even more wrong. This shouldn't be an RGE, a resume generating event. <laughs> Small businesses are especially susceptible to this um, because they don't have the resources to recover from a major interruption to their business. So where do we start? Of course, we start with brainstorming. Either invite members um, from different business units, depending on the size of your organisation, or hold sessions with each individual business unit individually. Um, this is for the business. It shouldn't be owned by IT, and we'll come back to that a little bit later. Talk about what your business deliverables are. Do you need to produce widgets or provide support for widgets? Settlement of large international financial transactions. Um, maybe you have some legal compliance reporting that must happen to certain deadlines. Um, what are you required to achieve these? I mean, you're obviously going to need people and staff. Those people and staff are going to need locations to work from. Um, they're going to need workstations to do the work on. They're going to need back-end systems that support the work they're doing, depending on how your organisation functions. Know what these things are, really. Assign weights to those things. How important are each of the things that each business unit does, and how important are the things they need to do those things? Can they run without a computer and just use pen and paper for a little while and just take calls to do their trades? Think about the kinds of events you're susceptible to in your location and in your industry. This might be that you're working in the CBD and your head office is in the CBD and it's next to a major public transport um, centre. It might be a train station or it might be a, an internet interconnection. Um, those are obviously prime targets for things like protests or terrorist activity. Depending on the scope of your business, this may need to be something you consider. Um, you may lose access to your facilities based on this. Um, so loss of physical access to site, um, public transport and interruptions, so, um, strikes and the like, um, protests or civil unrest and service outages may impact your access to your physical site. You may not have power at your site. It may be completely useless to you. Loss of access to your virtual site or your data centre, um, which might be in your office, it might not be. Um, so that might be things like network um, interruptions, the cloud, you know, it might rain, um, or the ciders. <laughs> and consider loss of staff as well. Um, we all have single points of failure within our organisations. 
think about who those are um, and make sure you have enough documentation and support from other team members to make sure that that shouldn't, that that won't have too great an impact on the rest of your organisation. Um, again, prioritise based on likeliness and impact um, and target those with the highest residual risk first. Think about those situations, reduce your residual risk um, across the board as much as possible. And revisit these every so often. Think about what might have changed. Identify what you need to recover from an event. Talk about what will happen after you gain access to your site again or your production systems. Will you need new hardware? Do you need to provision new cloud instances? Where's the company credit card? Backups, 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 backups. I'm a fan of the three, two, one, three copies of your data, two different media, one offline. Um, know what system you're using, know where your backups are and how to get them back quickly. Um, putting them in something like, um, I think it's Glacier is the, the Amazon service, might seem like a great cost efficient idea at the time. Look at how long it takes you to download those again. Internet in Australia is wonderful. Might take a while. <laughs> Keep in mind as well, your backups are only as good as your last tested successfully full restore. Um, it's okay to test your backups and say, oh, I got that file back for, for Joe in accounting. But what about the entire system? Does your accounting software come back up? Um, are all of your documents there? Maybe you've been doing forever incremental backups and your rsync balked at some point. <laughs> it happens. Um, and will you need to perform data entry from you know, paper forms or the like, or to pull things back from your BCP system into production? How long will that take? Do you need additional resources? Test it. Find out where the bugs and assumptions are in your process as well on recovery. Work through those. I should have redone my animations, apparently. Um, Discuss with the business who has the authority to declare that a BCP is being put into effect. Who makes that decision? Is there more than one point of contact to make that decision as well? Decide on the expected circumstances and process for that decision being made as well. Does somebody else need to sign off? Are there other people that you need to notify up the chain as well? Part of the process should be decide at the earliest opportunity possible document the decision and communicate the situation clearly to all affected. On the topic of communication, consider your communication chains. What platforms will you use? Do you have everyone's contact details? Do the people who need them have a list of mobile numbers of all of their staff so that they can contact them? Don't assume email will be available. Maybe don't assume phones will be available. It really depends on the situations you've identified. Um, something that we had at uh, Treasury Corporation Victoria was a, a little wallet card and it had a form on there to do a phone tree. So if you had enough phone numbers of people in your team, um, you know, your manager might ring you and say, I need you to ring X, Y and Z, here are their numbers, let them know the situation. And it's a, it's a slightly more expedient way obviously to get that information out in a slightly analogish format um, when your distribution lists don't work. Testing. Like all things, practice makes perfect, or at least easier and an understanding of what's going on. Practice early, practice often. Get real users to do your testing. Um, grab one or two people or you know, some minimum quorum of staff from each business unit for an hour or two. Have them really kick the tires of your BCP systems and their BCP systems. Um, uh, the scenarios we discussed earlier, pick one and test around it. They don't need to be serious and dry. You don't need to say, oh, Southern Cross train station's you know, been raised to the ground. Nobody can get into the city. How are we going to work around this? Um, simulate the result of the event, but have some fun with the backstory. My manager at TCV was a big fan terrible cringeworthy movies. My favourite scenario we chose was Sharknado coming to Melbourne <laughs> and restricting access to the CBD. 
the real world scenario is obviously limited or no access to the building. I mean, they're sharks, right? <laughs> um, and remote working was required. But it lightens the mood of an otherwise boring process, and you get to write a little bit of a blurb, and everyone reads it and has a good chuckle. Have your participants measure their results? How effective and efficient were they? Decide on a scale of how much you think they should be dependent on IT versus how autonomous they should be able to achieve their work. Did they have the same results as they would normally expect? Measure against your production systems. Make sure that they're configured the same. You might not get the same results. Because we all do our changes in production and disaster recovery, right? <laughs> Consistency. Um, was the system and process easy to use? Did they need IT assistance? Record your results as well. It's important to be able to see where were we 12 months ago? Have we improved? You might hopefully get to the point where you start having to worry about really minor details. Um, I know that in the three years that I was with TCV, we went from having somewhat major issues that would require constant IT assistance to work through you know, wonderful things like Excel macros. Um, and then we got to the point where the person who was running the macro knew what to expect and they knew how to work through it. And we helped them rely less on Excel macros because Excel macros make me sad. <laughs> and we also worked on the systems to make sure that we were able to improve. And we started to have to just focus on really minor issues and making sure that the experience for them was better. But we were able to measure that and we were able to quantify that information. Um, as I said, BCP isn't an IT-owned process. Try to limit the direct dependency of users on IT during the BCP event because you will have a lot more work to be doing than reminding them where their shortcuts are because they're not on the desktop anymore. Convert your results into action items. Yay, tickets. Um, things such as, oh, the jump box is terrible and doesn't work with the hideous software the accounts team use. Action item. Make the software comparable to account uh, to production. Or we discovered that we thought we only needed data set A and we had that available to us whilst no sites were available, but we actually needed the corresponding data from data set B and C so that we could correlate it with our customer sets. Action, automate an export of data sets B and C as well. Um, having data available offline is important. You need to work through some system to make sure that you've got up-to-date data that they can take with them securely. Um, they're secure USB devices, or maybe you'll do something cool with GPG. Um, you'll just have to know how competent and technical your staff are to work with a system like that. When you finish your action items, have the user who reported it and experienced the issue retest it and sign off and agree that they're satisfied that that system now works the way they expect it to. If you have some sort of disagreement with them, have an open dialogue around what they can actually expect and what you can reasonably deliver in that scenario. This will help with the culture. And book your next test. Test early, test often. Multiple times a year is best if you can do it. Include different people next time. That way then a different set of people have that experience. They'll bring different issues and everyone gets an understanding of what this BCP thing is. As I said, BCP isn't owned by IT. We're just here as an enabler. We're here to enable the business as a continuation of our support of the technology they use day to day. Each business unit or team should have, aim to have their own BCP documentation that will outline how to perform their critical functions under a different set of circumstances. Talk with the business, develop an open dialogue, build a positive culture by maintaining that open dialogue with the business about what they think they need and how you can work together to deliver it. Find your pain points and try to build in resiliency. Perhaps one system doesn't sync particularly well. Maybe work on that between tests so that within the next test you know that it will work better. Or perhaps you know that your users have a bad experience with their, their offline data set sync. So work on that, target that. 
um, and try to build incremental improvement test on test. Have no good restore points. Test your backups. Um, on the, the work on good UX as well, observe your users' pain points. Ask them what they're having difficulty with. You might even find they have the same issues in production and they've just assumed that's the way it is, but there's actually a really simple fix. It's a good way to make an easy win. Did I mention testing often? Your chances of successful disaster recovery are only as good as your last tested good restore. An untested backup might be completely useless. When you're testing your backups as well, document the process. Use this documentation every time and keep it updated. Give this documentation to the new guy and say, hey, we're doing our monthly <coughs> restore test. Can you spin up our entire production environment? Find out where the information is missing because it might not be you doing the restore. Do a full system restore in a separate environment and document the order as well that you need to bring up your systems. Um, do this, you don't need to do this as regularly as your individual backups, but at least maybe between version change, major version changes or if you introduce a new system into the mix. Hardware is expensive. Recalling backups from S3 or similar can be expensive. Know what your insurance will cover if you've actually lost a site or physical hardware and have good relationships with your vendors to make sure that you can get hardware as quickly as possible to get yourself back up and running. I'd like to talk about what we can do as well when things really go wrong. A perfectly valid response to this scenario is that you are no longer here and it's no longer your problem. But regardless of your ability to see if this actually works out, I think it's a fascinating problem set um, and something that as an empathetic person, I would like to hope that my colleagues won't get the worst of it at least. So the scenario we're talking about here is in-house IT is unavailable. The hit by the bus scenario, or as mentioned this morning in the keynote, the got on a bus and went somewhere else scenario. No opportunity or time for handover. This is the worst case scenario. If I haven't mentioned it enough, documentation is important. This is a documentation backup and process talk. I'm sorry. A plus side is that it makes your onboarding process super easy. Here's the stack of documents. Please read them. There might be a test. Secure credential storage is super important as well. But I'm sure you're all smart people and you already have this suitably under control. But how do, how do you hand over those, those securely protected credentials, that KeyPass database password or that GPG encrypted file? Shamir Secret Sharing is really awesome cool maths from the 70s. If anyone saw the, I think it was the Security and Privacy Miniconf yesterday morning, um, uh, Joey Hess did a talk about a, a utility that he's made using this. I think it's really awesome. And so I really needed to find a way to apply it. <laughs> um, so Shamir Secret Sharing allows you to divide a secret, a password, a passphrase, a GPG key um, into a number of shares and require a predefined quorum of shares to recreate the original secret. Let's say that I have a password um, Hunter2 and I want to divide it into 10 parts. It doesn't grab one letter for each or something like that. It uses funky line math geometry, look it up on Wikipedia, I'm getting weird looks, it's cool, um, <laughs> to allow you to recreate the original secret but only from, say, three parts of the 10 that you've created. And you can define how many that minimum is. And it's such that quorum less one is no more information than just knowing the size of the thing you're trying to recreate. So it is useless. It is the same as if it was GPG encrypted or similar. It's just garbage data. There's various libraries and tools that exist to generate and rejoin shares. Um, the one Joey has talked about 
has a bunch of stuff on top of it as well around passwords and things that might make this particular application a little bit difficult um, because this isn't about you individually pulling the thing back together, but somebody else who doesn't have your information but is trusted. So I'd like to walk you through an application that I've concocted. Um, it's probably a little over the top and complex, but I'd really like your feedback on it. Um, I designed it for use at TCV. Um, it was never put into use because another solution was chosen um, that I won't go into. I've had the opportunity, to, I haven't had the opportunity to present it to anyone else since, so I'd really love your feedback on it as well. So we take a copy of the credential store that we discussed earlier and we place it in an accessible location um, to the authorised parties in a tamper-evident evident envelope. Um, this could be as simple as an envelope with you know, a signature across the, the seal or something like that. We just need to know if someone has accessed this. It's important so that we think we can go back and make sure that no one has taken the protected data and made a copy of it so that we can cycle passwords if we need to. Encrypt the passphrase for the password store using a new, fresh GPG key that is only used for this. Place the, yes, the encrypted passphrase that we used to GPG, the encrypted GPG key, sorry. The key, place the key, the private key, um, no, yes, that one, the passphrase to the key, and you allow the key to be accessible as well in the envelope at the same location. Um, Shmir secret sharing is then used to generate a number of shares for the board members or the, the team members who will be used to access the information. Place each of their shares in an envelope and give it to them. Tell them to store it somewhere very secure. Outside of the building in their homes. That's why board members, for example, because they're not typically on site um, and they're people who will survive any sort of event. Um, in the event that you then need to recreate, the board members reconvene and they you know, get some inter external contractor in. They can rejoin their secrets um, to get the passphrase, which can then be used to open the KeePass database and then give access to the external contractor to allow the organization to keep running. It allows you to make sure that the information is distributed and it is offline. No one person has all of the password, but it also means that if you do lose the board member's passwords individually, you can regenerate that GPG key and recreate that information. So that way then, if you lose the KeePass database or similar as well, it's already got a new password. You've reprocessed it, you've updated it, it is protected regularly review the security of those. Regularly review the security of those. I thought there was more dot points. Um, if a complete breach is suspected, of course, begin your password change process. You have password change processes, right? Regularly password change process. But how do we apply this to our own systems? We all run our own email, we all have our own file servers, we have matrix servers and IRC bouncers and websites for ourselves and our family and friends and something that I realised in Michael Cordova's talk just before, Bitcoin wallets. How many people have Bitcoin wallets that might actually have money in them? How do we allow our family and friends to execute on our wishes um, to maintain our servers and services and cash out our Bitcoin wallets? What about our cat pictures? In essence, the same principles apply. Document, backups, and a system to distribute that information so that it can be reconstituted and gained access to securely. Documentation. Your passwords to systems that you wish somebody else to gain access to when you no longer have them. A list of your services, your hosting providers, your domain names, your cloudy cloud. What uses them? What are the billing arrangements? Is it going to come out of the joint account that you have with your spouse or significant other? Are they going to be pulling the hair out going, what is this PayPal charge and how do I make it stop? What are the credentials so that they can do that easier without having to get you know, court ordered documents and the like? It's going to be difficult enough. What are your wishes for the above as well? 
Maybe you have some domain names that you've got with some friends for things. Maybe you wish for them to be transferred to that person. Or maybe you just say, you know, stuff a lot of it, burn it to the ground. I'm not here, bury it with me. It's up to you. If you have a will, you have a way. Talk to your lawyer about preparing a memorandum of wishes to accompany your next will update as well. And talk to your family and friends. Bonus points if you convince them to do the same as well. Digital legacy is going to be a growing issue. Um, we're all living more and more online. We have more and more online systems. Think about what might happen with them. Again, backups. Backups of your personal data. The pictures aren't just of you, maybe. Um, other people might want them as well. And how will they gain access to them if they're only on your personal laptop or your personal server that you, only you have the keys to? Encrypted backups are important, um, depending where you store them. And hopefully, they're being stored off-site, so encrypted is important. And don't forget to back up the encryption key as well. Back up your system configurations, because this isn't just for somebody else. You might need to use this as well. Bonus points if you're using config management, because then you don't need the original configs. You just need the config management. And you get to buy new servers and set up new things. Yay! And document it. Document your backups and back up your documentation. Test them. Test them. That new backup tool you found online last week might have sounded really good, but did it actually work? Apply Shamir's secret sharing or some other method to distribute the information of how to um, gain access again. Offer to do the same in return to your friends um, who maybe also have systems that they need securely stored or um, keys sh um, shared and looked after. It will come in handy if you need access to your backups yourself and you did forget to store your encryption key somewhere else. So in review, we've talked about how to create your BCP, documenting your business deliverables and requirements, reviewing the types of events that might affect your business, communication and authority chains, testing, measuring, and regression testing. We've discussed culture and how to build a positive culture. We've talked about disaster recovery and testing your backups and documenting your recovery process and steps required. We've discussed breaking the glass and what happens when you're not there anymore. We've discussed documentation and how it's a useful tool for onboarding as well. We've discussed secure credential storage, Schmier's secret sharing, and digital legacy. And again, documentation, backups, and secret sharing. Um, I'd now like to invite any questions, discussion, war stories, because I didn't have any, um, or feedback. Thank you. Yeah, um, I, I think one of the, the real impetuses for TCV building their disaster recovery um, was after 2001, September 11, um, where there was, you know, countless financial organisations that shared, you know, one or possibly both of the, the, the Twin Towers there. Um, and, you know, of course, they considered that their disaster recovery site was the other building. Um, and it's terrible to, to think about, you know, this human tragedy and applying just a real technical thing over the top of it, but 
that was, you know, people's livelihoods and, you know, mortgages and savings accounts and things that, you know, gone. Yeah. Having been through this recently, um, on behalf of someone who passed away, um, one of the things that you didn't really touch on that struck me as go going to be a much bigger problem is the increasing use of two-factor authentication. Mm. And often that's a device that either you won't have in a, in a PCP scenario or um, you may not have access to any longer or to be able to authenticate with if you're taking over from someone else. Do you have any thoughts about how to deal with that? My personal approach is to make use of the, the offline paper codes that you can use as well as backup. Um, people typically have a very protective approach to physical things as well. Um, I know that mine are very securely stored. Um, and that those who need them know where they are as well. Or on systems that I care slightly less about but still have two-factor, they're in my password store, which isn't probably a good place to put them because if you get my password store, you also get my two-factor. Need to work on that one more. So a couple of things. Uh, first thing for backups, as you say, it should be remote if possible. Mm. Uh, one issue is, of course, how much bandwidth you have and most people, are, many people doing are sitting back horrible on efficiency. Um, so if anyone hasn't heard about it yet, if you get, if you get a chance to use ButterFS, you can do block level backups of just one chain, which works a lot better for slow links, or if you have 10 bazillion files, which would take hours to sync, to just scan with rsync before you can back them up. So if you're interested in doing that, just look at ButterFS or the talk I gave two years ago, or whichever other program, or just ask me whatever. The next question, uh, another question comment is, <laughs> Uh, I think some companies, at least Google is one, but I think there's a few others, you can set up uh, next of kin contacts. Mm. And if I don't log in after three months, they will start being like my wife yep. and then my brother and telling me, hey, you know, we're about to give out your accounts. And if I still don't reply, basically then when switch, it will give out my account to someone else, which is a nice way of doing it. Yep. Of course, each company needs to do that to be able to benefit from that. Yeah, and th there's no real standard. I did. Um have a little bit of a look around at those. And yeah, Google's one of them. I think Facebook has something as well. And you know, they do their whole you know, look at pictures and name who they are to make sure that it's at least somebody who knows you. Um, you could certainly factor that in, but as you say, that's, that's three months down the track. How many emails have you been billed since then? You know? um, your phone bill suddenly gets turned off, or you know, you, your water company sends you your bill electronically and the water gets shut off. It's not a great experience for anyone. I come from the city where earthquakes have happened, and in February, when things got bad, um, I work at the University of Canterbury, and we went out into certain buildings, um, and those buildings that had a high priority, they sorted out first. Um, in the department I was working at the time, um, for students, there was the need to use some proprietary window software, which was only installed on desktop machines. Hmm. Um, a lot of people in other departments went around um, and got machines out of buildings. I decided to do the complete opposite and leave them in the buildings because the electricity was no problem. And using an existing Linux machine, I knocked up um, a system where people could um, remote desktop into the, each machine through an ECSH tunnel. Hmm and they could get a desktop right. and they could run the software. And I did a web page which listed all the machines in the room and they could pick one. And yep. I, that one's not being used right now because, you know, Windows is not exactly mm. a multi-user <laughs> system. Um, so they could see if the machine was available or not and use the machine to log in and do their stuff. And if they were on there for more than three hours, it kicked them off automatically so someone else could do it. Um, and it worked pretty well. Mm. Um, I. I could see 17 people simultaneously using the system in the times that I, yeah. I, I went and looked. Um, so that was the case of just knocking up something quickly um, that people yeah. on whatever operating system they were using could um, get access to something that was physically otherwise unobtainable and it took the pressure off people having to get into a car or yeah. a bike to go somewhere because of, well, the roads were crazy. Yeah, and, and that's sort of what I mean as well when I say that you'll have so much else to be doing. 
um, that you won't be able to help them work through you know, how the software works on this new PC because you've not quite configured it properly because you'll be working on more holistic solutions like that to gain access to systems um, so that people can use them originally or as they were originally set up. Hi, great talk. Um, I, work for, I work for a small not-for-profit um, company that has a limited IT budget. Yep. Um, we don't take our fire drills seriously, let alone um, these paid. But how do you think I can convince our employees and our CEO to implement something like this? Because sadly, we don't have one. Um, I'm an eternal pessimist, so that's kind of my approach. Um, just questioning what would happen when, you know, someone isn't here or, you know, what happens when you don't have access to that system is probably really the, the best you could do, um, other than maybe just to start doing things yourself, um, you know, making sure that you have at least the data you would need to continue running. Um, the, the fire drills thing you mentioned as well is interesting. Part of our annual process was to do a full evacuation. Um, there'd be a, a set time and suddenly everyone would, you know, the alarms would go off and everyone would leave the building and would make sure that the full system worked. It's, it was a full test. Um, we'd go stand, you know, at the, the evacuation point and then we'd go, okay, right, where are we going to work for BCP this afternoon? Um, and we'd head off there and then that would start the disaster recovery process as well. Um, and at the end, you know, we compare against production, make sure it did match. Yeah. Um, two quick things. Um, first of all, the, the scenario of 9-11 and that before, I had an employer and we had a relationship with buildings next to each other, mm. no problems. We moved, did the same thing with um, Bankstown Council as it happens. Oh, they had a fire and it worked. So <laughs> having things in adjacent buildings can work, yeah. but the risks of change, as 9-11 showed, and I think people need to look at what the real risk is and what the, the distance that the same event could affect yep. in that. Um, secondly, on testing, and this might help your thing, um, it tests can be all sorts of things. One of the sorts you can do is simply a paper walkthrough. One, and I suggest you get them to do that. You sit there and say, right, for the rest of today, the assumption is this. Mm. What would you do? How would it work? And things like that. So you can get a variety of tests with a variety of different users and levels of users and make, make a lot of sense. Yep. Again, some excellent questions from the audience. And on behalf of Linux Conference Australia, I'd like to present David with a token Thank of you. our thanks. Congratulations, David. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you. <laughs>